Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the Trusted CI webinar for June 24th, 2024. I'm your host, Jeanette dopp -Heidi. Trusted CI is the NSF Cybersecurity Center of Excellence, and these webinars are part of its mission to deliver high-quality, actionable guidance regarding cybersecurity to the NSF community. More information about Trusted CI can be found at trustedci.org. Today's topic is the Transformative 12, Taking a Practical, Evidence-Based Approach to Cybersecurity Controls with Craig Jackson. Craig is Deputy Director at the Indiana University Center for Applied Cybersecurity Research, uh, CACR for short, and is a member of Trusted CI. Uh, before we begin, I have a few things to note. First, this presentation is being recorded. Uh, second, um, uh, attendees are welcome to type questions in during the presentation, but um, I think from there, we'll hand things over to Craig. Craig, welcome. Thanks so much, Jeanette, and thanks for, for folks joining today. Um, it's wonderful to see some familiar familiar names on the list, and welcome to, to folks who are new. Uh, really, really happy to be here. Uh, wish I could be physically hanging out with all of you all. Um, so yeah, as Jeanette said, I'm going to talk about taking a practical evidence-based approach to cybersecurity controls. If you know much about Trusted CI, you've heard of the Trusted CI framework where the controls are just a piece of an overall cybersecurity program, but they are important. And so this talk is all about you know, how, how to take a really practical uh, approach to them. Yes, I'm going to be talking about this set of controls called the Transformative 12, but there's going to be a lot of context wrapped around those for you. All right, so but there they are. Uh, take a screenshot. Anyway, what, we'll come back to those. Those are the 12, but I'm going to launch into a bunch of context around, around what you're seeing here. So um, I want to start off with a little bit of uh, learning objectives, some quick housekeeping. And then I want to just talk big picture about motivation for this work. Then we're going to get into the programmatic role of baseline control sets, the, the role that these control sets play in an overarching cybersecurity program. Then, yes, we will talk about the transformative 12 and the research that, that's behind those. And then we'll close out um, with some takeaways and action items. And then I, I hope we'll have some good time for discussion. Um, so learning objectives. Um, after this, you will have and understand the basis for a small, highly prioritized set, uh, evidence-based set of cybersecurity controls. You'll understand the role that controls play in a competent cybersecurity program, and you'll have at least a little more understanding of why cybersecurity is a struggle for so many uh, organizations. Um, if you attended the, the my talk or watch my talk at the NSF Research Infrastructure work Workshop. This is very, very similar. That doesn't mean you can leave, but it's a it's a very, very similar talk to that one. Um, I, I think Jeanette has already shared the slides with folks. If for any reason you can't get those or don't get those, please feel free to reach out to me. I'd be happy to send them to you. Ignore item two. I thought you all might be able to turn your cameras on. You cannot. I'll just have to imagine your beautiful faces. Um, and I would encourage you, you know, write down your questions, throw them in the chat, whatever, save them. I'm going to try to go pretty quickly through this, this uh, slide deck, and hopefully we'll have a nice chunk of time um, at the end of the hour uh, for, for open discussion. And if you don't get your question answered or whatever, I definitely feel free to get in touch with me. All right. Motivations, big picture motivation. I want to talk about the struggle to get started and research, resource cybersecurity. So this is a quote from a U.S. Coast Guard Admiral uh, who I did some work with a few years back. And this is from an email where uh, Admiral Mogger summarized, I think, the pain, the struggle, the frustration that, uh, that we've seen, that I've seen in my like 12-year cybersecurity career. He just summed it all up. The, dis discussion, the, the discussion from industry, in his case, that's industry supporting the maritime transportation system, is that we know that this, this being cybersecurity, is a risk, but we don't know how to get started or resource it. That just summed it up. How, how the heck do we get started? How do we resource this problem? So why is there this struggle to get started and resource cybersecurity? There are legit challenges in cybersecurity, right? 
Attackers have a lot of advantages. They can, their first mover advantage, they often can act with impunity. Um, the cybersecurity field is fairly complex. It's multidisciplinary. It's fairly new, immature. And then I think, you know, one of the, the best documented uh, quantified problems in cybersecurity is that it's understaffed. We don't have enough cybersecurity experts and expertise to go around. Third is that most technology is fundamentally insecure. There's some major efforts underway, including if you're familiar with Trusted CI's work, the, the, the secure by design work uh, for this community. But most of the tech that we're dealing with, it's like the first airplanes or the first cars. It just wasn't built to be secure. I mean, email is a great example. It's just fundamentally an insecure technology. Also, just defending against nation states and well-resourced criminals is not business as usual for most organizations, right? We're, we're all being asked to defend against bad actors in ways that in other parts of our, our lives, our missions, our business, our, our research facilities, we don't have to worry about quite as much. And then finally, as a society, we haven't figured out how to appropriately carve up the burden. We haven't figured out how much of the cybersecurity problem should be your problem as a user, as a director of a facility, as a CIO. We haven't figured this stuff out yet. And a lot of, a lot of the problem is distributed onto people and to organizations that are not in the best position to, to really do a whole lot about it. So there are problems for real, but, there are also some myths, and these are really myths, and I've had people say these things to me, like when I've gone and spoken at a conference of people who are not cyber people. It's just an IT problem. It's not my problem, it's the IT problem. It is a people problem and it's a leadership problem. Um, and depending on your business, it includes both operations, information, information technology, operation technology, and the security of what you build and sell, right? It is much more than an IT problem. Secondly, uh, second myth, hackers aren't interested in my organization. Well, we know that's not true. I mean, we really know that's not true if you look around in this community or, or really any. But if it wasn't true before, right, then ransomware just made everybody a target. If your stuff is valuable to you and your stakeholders, then, you know, you could be a target. And we see attackers targeting K through 12 school systems and stuff these days. It's everybody is a target. Third one, I can just buy an insurance policy for this and stop worrying. We could have a whole, we could spend the rest of the hour, I could spend the rest of the hour preaching on this topic. I'll just leave it at this for now. You have to be very careful when buying and adhering to cybersecurity insurance policies. It's really important that you know what you're buying and why you're buying it. There's a, it, it, it's a treacherous place uh, to buy insurance. It's not just like buying car insurance where it's a really well-established market. And then finally, these attackers are so advanced, it's not worth trying to stop them. They have so many advantages. Like why, why would I spend time, effort, money, social capital trying to stop them? On this one, stay tuned. I'm going to try to prove to you that there's a lot you can do here. And then, okay, so finally about the struggle, there's a lot of noise to cut through. And this is not the only kind of noise, but it's one I'm gonna highlight in the context of controls, is that particularly in our society, a lot of guidance requirements standards come in the form of long checklists with no communicated evidentiary backing to support why, why am I being asked to do these 110 things? No apparent consideration of cost, too much focus on specific technical tactical controls, too little emphasis on building a competent cybersecurity program as a business capability and little or no prioritization. You know, 800-171 has 110 controls in it, I think. Just do them all. No sense of priority within that. This stuff dominates most discussions of best practices in cyber. So we typically find organizations that need specific detailed advice, a sense of what's actually doable, they need help with governance, communication, decision-making stuff, and ultimately they need priorities, help setting priorities. How do we get started? Okay, 
So starting to zoom in on controls, I'm going to talk about the programmatic role of baseline control sets. I think many people on this call are already familiar with the Trusted CI framework, so I'll keep the big overview very brief. Um, Trusted CI developed this as a reasonable, evidence-based, minimum standard for cybersecurity programs, right? What do you minimally have to do to have a competent cybersecurity program as part of your organization? It's organized into four pillars, mission alignment, governance, resources, and controls that break down into 16 musts. Controls only has two musts, and we're going to talk quite a bit about one of them. Um, this one pager that you see on the slide, there's a short URL there if you want to go, go grab that. I like to keep mine with me at all times. All right. So what is a cybersecurity program? It's, um, it's just a set of ongoing activities and projects managed in a coordinated way to obtain benefits not available from in managing them uh, individually or chaotic chaotically. It's making this whole organ of the organization uh, work together. Some example musts from the Trusted CI framework, some really basic stuff, right? Organizations must involve leadership in cybersecurity decision-making. Organizations must establish and maintain a cybersecurity budget. Some of these are just really, really fundamental. One of those is must 15 around baseline control set. So, so I'm going to go into some detail about this must. Organizations must adopt and use a baseline control set. Um, definition of controls, I'm trusting most people are kind of intuitively familiar. I won't read you the whole long technical definition, but these are these typically more tactical, technical uh, uh, protections, countermeasures that are designed to reduce cybersecurity risk. Um, you know, having a password on your computer is a control. A baseline control set is a predetermined third-party set of controls used as a default. All right, and these vary greatly in number, specificity, the goals of how the, how they were designed. And important here, uh, I'll talk about the verb use, right? The philosophy of the Trusted CI framework is that using does not mean that you slavishly do every single thing in the control set absolutely everywhere, like checking every possible box left and right, right? The set provides a place select controls and a standard to measure against it's but it does it's not this you got to do 100 percent doctrinal kind of thing some judgment is necessary and required um and of course baseline control sets may be legally imposed when handling specific types of data but for this community most organizations are not don't have a control set foist on them that applies across their entire you know operation so that's that must, got to do this. You can't just like go without, how is this community doing on must 15? So we've assessed 27 research infrastructure operators, uh, major facilities, mid-scale supercomputing centers are, are examples um, in our five half year framework cohort. So we've done since uh, 2022, we've done uh, five, six month uh, cohorts. Um, of all of those we've assessed, only nine were implementing or, or doing better than implementing on MUST 15 at the time of the, the assessment. So only a third have actually done this. That's a problem. Why is that a problem? Why is this a must? Um, you need a well-rounded diet of known good controls, right? Um, it allows you to rally your organization. It gives your organization a common language and structure. To work with. It saves resources, right? You don't have the resource burden of having to reinvent the wheel and come up with the controls yourself. Um, it, it helps you avoid gaps. A major risk, and I've, I've done a lot of assessments, a lot of cybersecurity assessments that look very broadly across an organization, both in this community and others. A major risk of ad hoc control selection is missing important doable stuff. You can be a very smart security person, and that doesn't mean that you got your head wrapped around uh, the, the whole list, so to speak. And really important here, a good baseline control set, taking that, implementing what is reasonable for you to implement, will, will prevent or mitigate the majority of attacks. It really will. The evidence shows it. 
And there's at least one really good uh, uh, baseline control set out there that you can just pull off the shelf and use. To that point, you know, what set do you choose? There are dozens of baseline control sets, uh, including several produced or funded by the U.S. government that could compete for your attention, right? We've got NIST CSF, the different 853 baselines, 800-171, which is really just meant for uh, controlled and classified information. CISA now has these um, CPGs uh, for critical infrastructure. And then the CIS controls. What Trusted CI recommends, what I recommend, my organization consistently recommends is unless a different baseline is required, for instance, contractually, we strongly recommend the CIS controls. These have gone uh, by different names over the years. Originally, it was the SANS Top 20. They've been around quite a while. They're on version eight. Why, do we, why are we such huge fans of these? They've been developed with input on a from a diverse community of experts and practitioners. It's not just a bunch of government people. It's, it's a really uh, broad ranging uh, set of, of practitioners and experts. The original ones were heavily influenced by NSA, who you know, have a lot of frontline uh, real world experience in this space. They're updated regularly, but they're not updated so regularly it's going to drive you crazy, but they do try to keep them fresh. They have made notable improvements over the versions. They overlap significantly with many other sets, right? It's not like we're talking about a completely different planet of controls than what you would see in these NIST sets and others. So they map. This is something that the more technical cybersecurity folks than me often say is that they're well, they're better defined than a lot of control sets in terms of practical application. That you can look at a single safeguard, like 1.1, like below the control level, the actual control level called safeguard, 1.1, 1.2, 6.3, and you really know what's being asked. They're, they're well-defined controls. And then finally, they're freaking prioritized. Hallelujah, right? Somebody's thought about priorities here. Um, they're free to go grab. They're behind an info wall. Uh, I haven't, they haven't like spammed me to death. I've put my information in there many times. Okay. Uh, also, I'll note that um, if you're considering these, but would be interested in how they map to other baseline control sets, CIS has done a lot of work to, uh, to help you see the mappings of this, of their set to other ones that are out there. So they, they have a whole navigator tool online. Okay. Right, so big theme of today is priorities. The CIS controls are fantastic, but they are made up of 153 safeguards. That's a lot. Um, none of them are free, right? It, none of them are just like, and I had a thought and, and it's working for my organization now. But like I said, they're prioritized. So the current version of the CIS controls is broken up into these things called implementation groups, uh, one, two, and three. And implementation group one is the, the most basic. So, okay, well, it's kind, kind of, they're giving you an obvious place to start. Um, I won't read you this whole quote, but they talk about it. This is the on-ramp. This is the starting point. There's an assertion here that in terms of uh, uh, evolving legal doctrine, that that these could be the emergent reasonableness standard, which I would fully support. I would testify to that because of, they're so much better defined than a lot of the other sets out there. If I was a judge, I would like these more. Um, so it's a set that that gets it down to what what was it? One fifty three. Now we're down to fifty six. So awesome. But 56 is still a lot of safeguards when you're trying to prioritize and have limited resources. I, I can say this for sure because again, I've, I've done a lot of assessments. I've worked with a lot of different organizations and we see, you know, it, even doing these 56 can really be a challenge, especially if you're starting from zero, right? So this is where we're gonna to start to get into the transformative 12 stuff. We, we need more prioritization. Um, to talk, to tell the story of the transformative 12, I need to give you a little background on this project called Cybertrack. So since 2022, uh, 
in my organization, IUCACR, and, 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 a, and, a, and a kind of sibling organization at Purdue University called CyberTap, have teamed up to build Indiana's local government cybersecurity assessment program. Um, at this point, we've conducted um, over 76 assessments on a wide range of local government entities. There's hundreds and hundreds of them in, in the Hoosier state. Um, the assessment methodology is based heavily on PACT, which we developed uh, for the Navy, um, but needed to be heavily streamlined uh, to do as many assessments as we need to do. So the, pro the overarching program here has two objectives. One, we need to help the specific local government entities receiving an assessment. We want to give them advice, not just like a score or something, and inform the whole state community's local government cybersecurity policy and strategy. So, you know, this, this gives rise to some requirements. I love to put our wonderful sponsor, uh, Tracy Barnes, the CIO of the state of Indiana on there, especially since he's looking kind of smug because he set these requirements on us, right? We've got to go help these under-resourced organizations with priorities. We've got to produce standardized, verified, and ultimately longitudinal measurement of gaps. And we need to do 342 assessments in four years. That's a lot of assessments. When we're not just, we're not going to let people self-assess, we're putting experts in contact with these organizations, carefully assessing how do we do 342 in four years and still have that positive impact? So we need more prioritization for real. Those organizations need prioritization and our program needed prioritization. We can't go assess every stinking control. So quick side note, um, in CyberTrack, um, the state uh, very happily adopted a dual standard in, in thinking about uh, how to assess local government entities. It's the trusted CI framework and the CIS controls. And for CyberTrack purposes, these are the six of the 16 musts that we down selected. So we knew we weren't going to be able to assess all 16 musts. We had to carefully go through and think about what are the most accessible and very most fundamental controls and that can uh, not controls, very most fundamental musts um, in that set. And that's what we're working with right now. And I'll, I'll come back and talk about the must and how they relate to controls a little bit more uh, as we go. But okay, back to controls. So IG zero, right? So we get CIS as IG one. We asked CIS, is there an IG zero you're not telling us about? And they were like cagey about it and kind of but basically said no. But I think all of us, you don't even have to be, you don't have to be a cybersecurity expert to think there's a list of 56 things. Surely some of those are more impactful than others. There's no way these 56 different controls are all like equally powerful. So how do we how do we build any confidence in what we're going to zoom in on? Um, I got to give a shout out to Emily Adams, my colleague at CACR. That's her her picture here. She did a lot of work uh, on this project to help help get us to the transformative 12. OK, so here was our research approach. Um, pretty. I think I think pretty straightforward, kind of down and dirty stuff. You've got to do what you got to do to, 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 to find the evidence-based approaches in this, in this young field. Start off by trying to identify what we call gold standard systematic studies whose results point to a smaller set of controls as the most powerful. So to be a gold standard study, this required us to have some confidence in the validity of the methodology used. And so because of this, we considered and eliminated a number of sources, right? So you can find lots of stuff, you know, on the internet that says, well, these are the most important things. But if we couldn't look, get any idea of what the, the process, what the research, what, what the basis was for that set, then it can't be a gold standard study. We're looking for evidence-based stuff. We got to be able to interrogate it some. So we're, we set out to look for those. Then whatever we would find, we'd have to map to the CIS safeguards because we're going to map. We need to map to one standard and compare and score safeguards that appear in more gold standard studies get a higher score. And we thought, okay, if a smaller set emerges, we'll need to do some validation, and we we've done certainly some validation. 
So these are the gold standard studies. And I'm very hopeful that we're actually in the broader cyber community starting to see some more work come out. And this list will hopefully grow in the coming months and years. But these are what we were able to find. I'm not going to spend time going into detail about all of these unless people want me to come back to them. But I will note that um, one of the things that was neat about these, these three studies is they each use fairly different methodologies, right? So you're seeing three different methodologies. Where are they overlap? Where are they triangulating when it comes to telling us what's most powerful? If they were all really similar to each other, it wouldn't be as exciting. Okay, so the results. 12 of the 56 CIS IG1 safeguards form the top group in our scoring scheme. 12. Now we're talking. Now we're talking prioritization. If you want to read more about this, there's a Lawfare article that discusses this some more. Um, and then there's also a link um, there. Actually, this, this needs to be updated. We have a newer uh, CyberTrack uh, aggregate results report out there that, that also talks about these. And there they are. Um, I'm not, I'm not going to dive in and like give a talk on all 12 of, of these, these controls, but I will point out, let me, let me jump forward real quick. Yeah. I will point out a few things. Um, one is that your favorite control may not be on the list. You know, I've had people say, well, I really like such and such a control. I think it's super powerful. And I'm like, I agree that's a, I can see how that would be valuable, but the beautiful thing about research is it doesn't care what your opinion is, right? This is the, we've, we've gone to some level of analysis that's beyond a bunch of individual opinions shouting in a room. Um, I'll also note, of the 12, you'll see three of them are MFA. And I'll also point out that some of these are as unsexy as 4.1, establish and maintain a secure configuration process. I mean, this is the, some of this stuff is, as it should be, really basic, really fundamental. Even arguably, some of it you might say, is that really cyber? Is that just good IT practice? And just to hammer on this multi-factor authentication point a little bit more, this is a this is a, um, a visualization from the Microsoft Digital Defense Report, and. Uh, this thing really represents what they've observed looking at a bonkers amount of, of data, that real-world data that they get to see. Multi-factor, I talked to, to uh, a, a, a pretty senior person connected to this team, and that MFA is right in there for a reason, okay? Um, Multi-factor authentication, all evidence-based work is indicating that this might be the most, if certainly one of the most powerful. You know, if you were going to start anywhere, have to have to emphasize and put stomp on this one. Um, I'll also say, and this is this is where I'm getting like, I, I hesitate to show you this, but again, we're we're talking about priorities. We'll point out these uh these three controls in bold red actually scored higher than the other ones in the 12. One of them being MFA for admin access. So really important note, this does not mean that these 12 things are the only important cybersecurity controls to do, right? I can think, for instance, in the, in the science environments that have a lot of operational technology on you know, tech that moves things around, that turns the telescope or whatever, HVAC that really matters for more than just whether I'm comfortable, um, and IT, network segregation, OT and IT systems, that could be huge, hugely helpful. You don't see that in this list, right? There's other important things to do, but what this research I'd assert does mean is that your confidence in the transformative 12 should be sky high, right? If you've, you've scratched your head and asked like, what, which of these things actually matter? You've got a list now that we should feel really confident in. Um, and this is one of my last uh, slides before we get into the kind of takeaways and action items. But I'll, I'll, I'll point out, speaking of other important things to do, I'll just come back and another plug for the Trusted CI framework, right? The Trusted CI framework is not a set of controls. 
It's about building a cybersecurity program. This is taken from, our, I've got this one actually up to date, our most recent report of aggregates, aggregate results from, um, from CyberTrack. Uh, my colleague and, and counterpart at Purdue, Joe Beckman here, uh, gave, like surprised me with this gift. He went and showed that there's a very significant correlation between organizations that are doing the must like having a baseline control set, like having a budget, like actually assigning personnel to cybersecurity and actually doing the safeguards that we measure in CyberTrack. They go together. It's not, a, as Jim Bazzi said, it's not a zero sum game. Strong suggestion here of a causal relationship. I would assert it's pretty clear that the musts in the framework are an enabler of getting these tactical things done where the rubber really meets the road and stops or disrupts attacks. Okay, take takeaways and action items. Really only one takeaway, I think it's, it's that you can absolutely massively decrease your cyber risk exposure. There is a lot that can be done. You can't get it to zero, but there's a lot of valuable stuff that, that uh, the organizations represented here today, today can do. So I, I would leave you with these action items. If you haven't already done these, do, uh, do your own gap analysis against the trusted CI framework. Go look at every one of those 16 musts, crack open the flip to the chapter in the framework implementation guide. Make sure you have a rough understanding of what that must means and ask yourself, are, is my organization doing these things? If so, great. How's it going? Is it time to tweak? Is it time to optimize? If not, why not? What are the barriers to moving forward with those? Very similar, I'd encourage you, certainly with help, you probably need to do both of these with help, right? Like it's gonna be the collective that can get to the factual truth on this stuff. Do a gap analysis against the transformative 12, um, then move to CIS IG1 if those are looking solid. If you have gaps on the 12, set out a plan to close them over the next month, so unless you've determined that there's it's an unclosable gap. Um, also, um, I'll, I'll note for folks uh, represented here who uh, are subject to, to the, the NSF's research infrastructure guide, um, the, when they release a draft for comment, there's probably going to be some discussion of priority controls or something like that. Pay close attention to that. Um, ask yourself, do these, does what NSF is asking about align with evidence-based practice, both research and your on-the-ground experience, and consider, consider um, uh, making public comment on what you see. Um, my experience watching this process over the years is that, that NSF takes uh, the community's comments on the RIG, on the Research Infrastructure Guide, very seriously and don't be afraid to, to weigh in on this discussion um, as, it, as it unfolds. Again, there's that link uh, to uh, the one pager for the musts, and there's the transformer to 12 one last time. And there's a bunch more links and a thank you and my email address. And we've got plenty of time for discussion. Yes, we do. Um, so uh, this Craig kind of intends for this to be an open conversation. So um, I can also enable if if anyone wants to ask their question um, over, you know, verbally, uh, just raise your hand and I can enable your microphone as well. We've got a question here. Um, can you talk about the vulnerability management in the context of your research? Yeah. Um... The, the vulnerability management safeguards, you know, it, in, in terms of, you know, the, the whole scoring scheme, it's like they show up, um, but they just do not score as high. Exactly why that is, I, I don't know. But this is one of the areas of, uh, of controls that it, it's one of the ones that I most often get some sort of question push back flack from security professionals about because they're like, hey, where where did where is this one? 
And yeah, it, it didn't make that cut into that very, very top group. Well, another question here. Why are there so many controls? Uh, the CS, you listed 153, if we remember correctly, that you have to prioritize Prioritize and what's missing if you only implement the IG1 or the, the T12, the transformative 12? Um, what's missing if you only do that? Why are there so many? Um, wow, well, nobody's ever... Thanks for the, the difficult question, David. I, why, why are there so darn many? I think it's just that... I'm going to take a swag at this, is that the the technology ecosystem that we've created is complex enough that there's a lot of ways for attackers to work their way through it, but there's also a lot of ways for defenders to put things in place uh, that mitigate those risks, right? Um, so, you know, is there any like absolutely complete list of all the possible controls out there. I don't, I don't know. Uh, I sort of doubt it. Right. And we'll keep dreaming up new ones, but what's missing if you only implement IG one or the T 12, there's, I think the answer, well, I think that if you implement as reasonably as you can all of IG1, you have like taken care of the mass uh, the, the, the mass of cybersecurity risk, right? If you get those things implemented, if you have a cybersecurity program that exists, right, that layered on top of that implementation, and you can you can stay implemented on all 56 of those things, you've knocked out a whole heck of a lot. Now, what CIS would say is that IG1 is really just this, they use the term on-ramp, and that once you get into IG2, you're really starting to add controls that match the complexity, sophistication, size of organizations like of the complexity of say an NSF major facility, right? That there's 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 more to do. And as you get into those more advanced things, they're matching up better with organizations that are bigger, more complex. I don't know, maybe not a particularly satisfying answer, but let's see. Would IG1 satisfy Trust CI framework must 15? Um so But actually, sorry, before I jump to that, oh, David has, do you want to go through these or do you want me to go through through them, Jeanette? <laughs> well, I, I just, I, I will read them because the, they'll be captured on the recording that way. Okay. So um, uh, we had a comment on uh, going back to the, to the, to the large uh, group of CIS controls. Um, I think it's because CIS is going for practical controls instead of the abstracted controls like NIST that actually cover several technical tasks. Um, thank you for adding that, that, um, context. And then we've got a question is NIST C CSF really a baseline control set? My understanding is it's a framework and still relies on 800, 153. Would the profiles be considered leading to baseline control sets? Um, <clears throat> uh, NIST CSF has a baseline control set in it. And I, in my experience, it's the only part of NIST CSF that anybody pays attention to. The other part that purportedly makes it a framework, um, myself and other organizations that I've seen take a close look at that part of CSF have found it not very helpful or clunky to work with. So the, the framework core within NIST CSF is a baseline control set. And yes, it does heavily reference uh, uh, controls as laid out in 853. And then I, I think you you cut yourself off. Did, did you, I don't think you addressed uh, whether IG1 would satisfy MUST 15. Um, so here, here's my somewhat 
studied answer to this, right? What I would recommend that an organization um, of, of much size or complexity do is say, we're adopting the CIS controls, but we're gonna, we're gonna use the implementation groups to prioritize, right? So um, if David, if, if somebody said, no, 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 I really just want to adopt IG1. Like I don't wanna think about the fact that there's the other hundred you know, safeguards. Um, I, that's a lot better than nothing, right? But, but I, I think it's a smart idea to, to not try to artificially carve off IG1 and just treat the whole rest of it like you're ignoring it. Take the whole thing, but be very prioritized about how you go about your gap analysis and how you go about implementing. I would always say start with the transformative 12 and and maybe some other fundamentals like inventory that don't score as high in our methodology for technical for weird technical reasons um, and then move to IG1. OK, I'm, I'm taking Yeah, that. and then another, uh, going back to the rig, uh, any idea where the NSF and the updated rig are headed? No, not not exactly. I mean, we might, you know, Mike Korn has given a number of public presentations. Um, he's the guy at NSF on point for uh, the changes um, to that the cybersecurity section of the rig. And and I couldn't I couldn't. I can't say anything that would that would replace, you know, getting it directly from 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 Mike's perspective. Yeah, let me. David, um, here's a video to Mike's webinar last month about the rig. Um, and there's a link in there to the slides as well. Oh, I just want to go back to Deborah's comment, right? This was mm -hmm. in response to David's question about, um, I think it was in response to the question about um, why are there so darn many controls in, in CIS? And um, she says, I think it's because CIS is going for practical controls instead of the abstracted controls like in NIST that actually cover several technical tasks. W whatever that's responsive to, I totally agree, Deborah. Um, like I, people who, I'm actually really good colleagues with one guy in particular who was heavily involved in the creation of NIST risk management framework, 853, stuff like that. And, and he will tell you that the way the NIST controls are written, it is like an engineer's nightmare. It doesn't look like requirements. It doesn't look like specifications. It's this thing that takes quite a bit of interpretation. And I do think CIS has has drilled down, has, has done more of that work for the user. I hope that's, I hope that fairly captured what Deborah was thinking, but I thought it was a really good point. We still have some time uh, left for the, for us to talk or, or uh, if you have any questions, again, if you want to ask your question verbally, uh, go ahead and raise your hand and I'll enable your microphone. Um, uh, also I should, I should note that our summit is coming up this October. So if you are planning on attending, um, we'll be opening registration pretty soon. Um, go to trustedci.org slash summit, and that'll take you to the, uh, the current 2024 page. Um, okay. A follow-up question here. Uh, how does organizational size play into baseline and imp baselines and implementing them, like how would a small business or freelancer handle this? So uh, if you go pull down um, C the CIS controls version eight document, for each implementation group, there's like a paragraph that explains, here's the kind of organization that we have in mind, right? And so, you know, I think under the CIS way of thinking, 
my guess is that a lot of larger research infrastructure uh, operations and like big universities and stuff like that would look at that and go, oh, they think we're an IG2 organization, we're, meaning we need to do all of IG1 and all of IG2 pretty darn well. Um, Again, I would emphasize that no matter where you're coming from, right, IG1 is first, right? It's, it's it, if, it, it, you know, you're running a Fortune 500 uh, business, but you've got no cybersecurity, like, let's start at the start. I would, I would strongly encourage starting it at IG1. Um, maybe sprinkling in some more advanced stuff if you've got the budget, right, to, to get some really kind of advanced help. Um, but the, uh, here's, here's the problematic part of Deborah's comment. She's like, like, how would a small business or freelancer handle this? I do think that the CIS controls, I, and I'd have to go refresh my memory about exactly what they claim about it, but at a certain level, at, at a certain size where you're, at, you're just a one, a one woman shop out there. Does does IG one even really apply well to your your business? Um, what I would encourage, uh, what I would encourage folks to do who are kind of like, man, are we too small for this to be relevant? Is to still have a look at the transformative twelve, still have a look at at IG one, and ask yourself, like, okay, which of these are like relevant and doable for me, and which of these am I? for instance, able to rely heavily on my like cloud provider, as long as I do my little piece, like turn on multi-factor authentication, am I getting services from somewhere else where somebody's got a certification or something where you can trust that they've got these things implemented? We also have a question on CMMC. What are your thoughts on CMMC one or two baseline control sets? I think David is just messing with me at this point. Um, the, the whole process of building CMMC has been such a cluster, you know? I mean, it's been such a mess. Like, one... 800-171 was not designed to be a, which, and that those requirements, you know, make their way into this CMMC thing, right? 800-171 was not designed to be a general purpose baseline control set, right? It was, it was designed, whether it was well-designed or not, for controlled unclassified information. And there are really powerful controls that including members of the transformative 12, I'll apologize right now and say, I can't remember exactly which ones they are, that are not in 800-171, which is not shocking because it was purpose built for confidentiality, right? And if, if the feds have ever given us any concept that's actually really been helpful in cybersecurity, it's the whole CIA triad, right? Confidentiality, integrity, and availability. For this community, right? It's not that confidentiality is never important. It absolutely is important sometimes. But data integrity, the availability uptime for systems to make sure we don't miss that once in a generation observation or whatever, those are really important too. So why why would we why would we zero in on that on that set? Um, I, I could go on, but I'm gonna stop there. Um <laughs> Not purposely messing with me. Truly curious about your thoughts. And the, yeah, um, listen, with a set that's as well designed as CIS, if you've got a choice, I would always go there. Right there, it, it, while net, the NIST stuff and the the. By the way, the U.S. government pays for MSI SAC and CIS. The U.S. government is actually bankrolling CIS as. There, there is a, there is a large and I believe growing content, like uh, contingent of organizations around this country that are really big fans of what CIS is doing. They're, they're not going anywhere. Okay, uh, Deborah. Um, yes, Deborah, go ahead and unmute. 
Yeah, just more on some MC and 171. If you actually read the section where they tell you why they didn't put other controls in there, they're assuming you're already doing a lot of stuff. So, yeah, it's it's not a baseline. It's very much, you have a program, but now you want to add GUI to it. This is what the controls you need to add. So I think a lot of people don't look at that. Mm -hmm. That's a great point. I'm, I'm really glad you brought that up. OK, a uh, few more minutes left. So any, any last minute comments or questions from the audience? What's next for this transformative 12? So I am really, and I, I think I mentioned this briefly, I would really like this to become a, a broader research agenda. And I mean broader in a couple of ways. One is that like CACR where I'm at, we're not real, we're not like a basic research shop, right? We're not gonna be, I don't think we're gonna sh start doing like randomized control trials of control effectiveness, but there are people doing that. Right. Like my colleague, Jeff Tully at UC San Diego is he's a, he's an an, practicing anesthesiologist and also a cybersecurity researcher. And he has done literally randomized control trials of phishing training effectiveness. Right. So there's it's a small number, but there's a growing number of, of more fundamental, basic and applied researchers out there that doing more of this stuff, saying we need an evidence ba evidentiary basis for these practices. Right. Um, so, so as that bigger research agenda grows, like what I see for CACR and organizations like Trusted CI that have a, a really heavy bent towards service, like we want, we want to be out there helping people is we need to systematically consume and encourage the very best of that research like Jeff is doing and transition that to practice. Right. And so, uh, I, I we're having conversations with with a few entities about what more we can do. Um, we we got to find a way to have the transformative twelve kind of line of research have some legs and continue and refresh and update. Um, but I think we need a broader community. This is not just something that like IU and Purdue are going to be able to tackle effectively by ourselves. So um, there's other there's other organizations at the who are more so even than us, right at the cutting edge of, of this problem, especially at a more basic level of research. And I'm, I'm really hoping we find a way to rally those people as a community to push on this. Great, thank you. Um, last call for questions or comments. Um, this has been a really fun discussion. Uh, reminder, again, um, if you are available to attend the Trusted CI uh, Cybersecurity Summit, um, that is October 7th through 10th. Um, it's going to be online and in person. Um, you can find more information about that at trustedci.org slash summit. And Craig, I just want to thank you again for presenting today. Yeah, please come to the summit if you can. Holler at us if there's there's you know challenges with that. Um, first mm -hmm. beverage is on me. Um, <laughs> and uh, I really want to thank folks for attending and for the fantastic uh, and hard questions uh, that that people posed. And um, yeah, I look forward to seeing a lot a lot of folks in a few months here. Great. Um, if if you are interested in sharing this recording, I'll be cutting the video and sending out an announcement about it. So please share this with your colleagues. And uh, thanks again for presenting, Craig. And um, have a great day. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Take care.